I definitely want to interview the guy. Yeah, he's smart. Some of the things he says, I don't always understand because I'm, you know, I don't know. Well, he would have to not be religious to be able to have all those interviews with Muslims because Jews can't go into those parts of towns. But I think he goes to like Ramallah or Bethlehem places. Yeah, I mean, Jews aren't allowed because they'll stop you. I accidentally, when I lived in the West Bank, I guess West Bank is not a, a Zionist term, Yehuda Shomron. I accidentally drove into Ramallah with my car and then the army stopped me. I don't know what I was doing. I mean, I made a wrong turn. And told me, what are you crazy? You know, turn around. You know, so they made me turn around because the license plates are different. Israelis have like yellow and blue license plate, I think. and Palestinians have either a green and white or a white and green license plate. But also to enter the checkpoint, you have to go in with like a non-Israeli passport. So I guess there's there's truth to that. So mm-hmm. you're saying that. Like, if you're Jew, you're not allowed to go to Bethlehem? That it's dangerous. You won't see people with kippahs in Bethlehem. And you won't see people with kippahs in Ramallah. So Jews do go to these places, but not as Jews. There's tons of tourists in Israel. The bulk of the people you're seeing walking around in the shops in Bethlehem and stuff like that, and even in Ramallah, are tourists. Christian tourists, Muslim tourists, Japanese people. But for someone to walk in with a kippah, that they can't do. I think the soldiers would stop them just because that's it's like just inciting Arab anger. Gotcha. Well, the well the temple is called a house of prayer, but it's not like the sole location. It's not like a synagogue is today. It, it, it functioned much differently. I think that statement, a house of prayer, is not the prayer that Jews recite nowadays. It means something else. Prayer in the Bible is more like shouts of praise than the Amidah. Because according to Halakha, that whenever the word prayer is used in rabbinic literature, it only refers to the Amidah, a.k.a. Shemona Esrei. Only that. Even the Shema is not considered a prayer. So for sure, on the Temple Mount, people didn't pray the Amidah as a group. I mean, I'm sure probably priests on the side prayed on their own, but not like in unison, like some sort of congregation. I'm not the most articulate person in the world. I debate because I want my ideas to be influential because I think that I could bring something to the world that will improve people's relationship with God. I don't debate because I feel that I'm a good debater. So I force myself to have discussions with people. Honestly, like I'm more of an introvert. But because I have thought these things through, I'm able to come out on top on these discussions, which makes me think that people who don't want to debate is because it doesn't make sense to them fully. And that's typically the case with people I talk Torah with. It seems like they're just reiterating whatever they hear a rabbi say, but they never really thought about it. I'm not saying going into the text. First, you have to think about it. And when you're thinking about it, right when it starts not making sense ethically, then is when you try to hop into it and see if that's really what the source material says. And nine out of 10 times, it's not because things either confirm the obvious or are typically wrong. It seems like an ethical person reads Torah and it just makes sense to them. But I think when someone who has a value system, when they hear like a rabbi spewing hatred and just insulting someone else or saying something that just sounds weird, and it just trips all these red flags, which I don't know about most, but it fuels me to just find it in scripture and nine out of 10 times show that it's not what appears there in the way the person's saying it over. So most people who don't dialogue with people is because they don't really have a clear understanding of what they believe. Okay. Um, yeah. Where, uh, did I already ask this question? The minion, where, where did we get, where did they get the, like, did they just pull that out of thin air? To count you in a minion? Or do you have a reference passage like from Leviticus or? It's not in the Torah, but the notion of there being 10 is the instance of the spies that they're called an evil assembly, that that is what's considered a minyan, that an assembly of people, a quorum, is 10 because of that statement. And then the rabbi said that there's certain things you could say, it's called davar shabik dusha, basically words of holiness, additional words of holiness you could say during prayer with 10 people. Well, that doesn't mean that you can't pray unless you have 10 people. But things like Borhu, things like the repetition of the Amidah, Kaddish, these things you can say if you have a minion. But that doesn't mean that you can't pray unless you have a minion. 
the notion of praying with the minion is completely rabbinic. As a matter of fact, the Talmud doesn't even exclude women. So I think the first person to exclude women is probably the Rosh. The Rambam doesn't mention it. Shohan Aruch does exclude women. There's actually a rabbi known as a Mordechai who says, the Mordechai says you could include a woman as a ninth. I mean, nowadays, it's such a important topic because of Kaddish, because of Kaddish. The reason people say it nowadays is a much, much later notion. People say Kaddish for the dead nowadays. Um, yeah. That's why praying with the minion is such an important thing nowadays because you can't say Kaddish and people with dead relatives can't give uh, their dead relative one step out of purgatory. Yeah. Okay, next question. Do you need, need, and I don't know how, and this is a conversation I'm having. I don't know how you would define the word need here because I'm not getting a, an exact definition. Do you need to be circumcised to be saved? Salvation, whatever that is to you, Asher, answer the question. No. First of all, the Torah doesn't mention salvation outside of uh, the notion of redemption, of geula. Redemption in Torah is always being saved from an occupying force, from exile, or from being destroyed because of your sins on earth. But being saved on earth, it could apply or have some heavily connotation to it. It does speak in Torah about being written in some book. It doesn't really explain what that is. But that notion of salvation itself, that everything we do is to get into heaven, is a very much Jewish concept. It's not a concept that appears in the Torah, right? but it's Jewish. You know, there's a lot of things that are Jewish that are not Torah-based. But it seems that if it's God that's doing the saving, doing what he tells you to do should be the best way to get on his good side. So I would assume just obey his instructions. And that would please him enough that if there is an afterlife, you gain a ticket. But the notion of being saved in the Christian world just really means getting to heaven and not being sent to hell, which again, exists in the Jewish world. There's different opinions to what hell is in the Jewish world. And some people say is a place of torment for 12 months. And that's just for Jews. But one opinion is that Gentiles just disappear. But this is all conjecture because the Torah doesn't say, Tanakh doesn't literally say. So like, can you be saved without conversion or without circumcision? Isaiah 56. There it does say that he keeps the Sabbath and he holds true to the covenant. So, I mean, the covenant includes circumcision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because Abraham, and that's the thing, is lots of Christians actually do circumcise. And then it just became a thing that they did. Maybe not so much for religious reasons. Like if you ask a Christian today, would you ever not circumcise? No. Well, what about the, you know, party of let's not circumcise. Let's keep our boys natural. Well, no, that's weird. Many, many Christians still feel that it's un, it's not normal to not mm-hmm. circumcise because it's what they were raised to believe and so forth. And it becomes the Abrahamic faith. Mm-hmm. That's why. These are developed ideas. And this is why that we really have to weigh things out. And I think that the notion of a scale, some sort of heavenly scale where God weighs your good deeds against your bad deeds is probably the most reasonable way to look at this. Because it's hard to believe that someone who strives to be very God-like, just keep his commandments, is in some way not going to please God just because he, was, he wasn't able to circumcise himself. Well, the instance appears in Judaism that if it's too dangerous for a child to circumcise himself, then you don't circumcise him. Like if it's going to cost him his life, let's say. Like the case of my son. So my son is on Coumadin, which is the strongest blood thinner that we have. And Mm. so, you know, I even went to the rabbi. I said, what do you think? I really want to do this. And um, but my son was born with a heart condition. He was actually transferred to children's on his eighth day of life, barely alive. So that was not going to happen. But nevertheless, um, I'll leave it up to him when he gets older to make that decision. So So just a modern day real life example of what you were just talking about. So the person asking the question, I don't think it's Jewish. I think, I mean, they're Christian. So it's it's actually on your page. You should go check it out. (laughs) I think that most Jews don't ask like very simplistic questions like that or just heaven and hell. Only one person saves. Well, saves from what? And it saves you. Why? If you want to speak about obligation, there's no obligation to try to get to heaven. But, um, So your haters back. It's not just about thinking about yourself, Asher. We depend on our sages to guide thought. Ethics has nothing to do with it. We follow mitzvot because Hashem told us to. That sounds nice, but try presenting that to some inquisitive college kid. 
I'm pretty sure the person who's saying that believes in outreach, like what people call Kiruv. So that's not going to draw ethical people to your belief system because the Hebrews, when they came out of Egypt, they didn't follow God just because he claimed to be God. God had to make himself lovable to the Jewish people. This is why like, we don't see God punishing the Jewish people till much, much later, till after he gives them the law. And then he begins to show that love can exist without standards. So this is why, how can someone be elevated above anyone else for choosing the right path if we just follow the Torah because God says so? No, the way we elevate ethical people like versus unethical people is because that person makes a choice to follow the correct path because he's able to validate the Torah as ethical. How can you ever confront a Muslim and tell him, a radical Muslim, and tell him, how can you continue behaving in such a manner if it's unjust, if it's unethical, when he could just give you the same response you gave me? Well, I believe my religion because of what my sages and the text tells me to do, not because I validate it as ethical. So in that case, you want them to validate their religion as ethical or unethical, thus leave it. But regarding Judaism, that we're just supposed to check our brains at the door. That's kind of a double standard. I remember once I had a friend in Israel who was there to convert. He was from Holland. And then I asked him, why are you converting to Judaism? And he told me that he was going through his grandparents' uh, things. And then he found like old Talit. And then he found out that his father was Jewish or his grandfather was Jewish. And I said, that's why you're converting to Judaism? He's like, yeah. yeah. So then I told him, if you found out that your grandfather was a religious Muslim, would you become Muslim? And then he's like, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> of course, we have to judge things on an ethical scale. We don't just do things because God tells us to do it. Now, once you have validated the Torah as ethical, the bulk of the Torah makes sense to you. Then that you can accept the commandments that don't make so much sense to you because the bulk of it makes sense. But to repeat the nonsensical line that I'm following the truth, I'm following the truth. Well, somebody told you what truth is. If you didn't initially make an attempt to validate it as true against some ethical standard. And this is really like where the notion of the seven laws came from, that every individual is born with a basic sense of morality, a basic sense that God could adjudicate you against. And this is why God could reward others and punish others for not making the right decision to follow the right movement, right? But this is why Abraham was elevated to such a high level, because he was able to come to the conclusion that there had to be one God, and this God had to be unique from every other God. He had to be a God that one could emulate. This didn't, he didn't have any text that he was going by. He was judging God against his bare ethical standard that everyone is born with. The thing is, some people blunt that ethical consciousness that they're born with. Now, it's not enough to get you all the way, but it's enough to get you to the doorstep of some ethical system that could push you the rest of the way. So this notion that we only keep commandments because God tells us to keep them, no matter how unethical that God may be, like if you're part of some destructive belief system, it's just stupid.